Jesus Christ. The reason we are here today is because of Jesus. One of the things that preachers do when they prepare sermons is to seek the Lord about what message to deliver. And when I first prepared this message, and it was probably over a week ago, and God has confirmed what he wants me to speak on today, I considered it one of the most difficult messages that I had to deliver. At one stage, I thought it was too dangerous. I considered asking pastor to stop me mid-sermon if he felt that was appropriate. But then I heard from God from a really unusual place, or maybe the usual place, depending on where you consider the voice of God comes from. Because I said to my wife, I said, I don't know whether God wants me to to say this or I'm finding it difficult to whether I should do this or not. And she said something very profound. And she said, well, let God speak, not you. Now, you may say, well, that's pretty obvious, Pete. That that really is pretty obvious. But sometimes it takes something obvious to cut through, to get to the heart of the matter. So I'm going to preach it, and Pastor can take me off shouting if he wants halfway through if he thinks it's still too dangerous. But I don't think it is now because I discovered something when my wife said that that made the message less dangerous but still just as important. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 23. The Gospel of Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And I'm just going to read this scripture. It said, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The scene was someone being crucified. The scene was someone being crucified on a cross. The scene was someone being crucified with two thieves or also being crucified. That was the scene that we come across in the Gospel of Luke here 
And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I'm going to put it to you today, a question. I'm going to ask you personally the question, what you think the answer is. Who was Jesus forgiving on the cross? Who was Jesus forgiving on the cross? Now, I want to do a sort of prelude. If you look uh, earlier in the chapter, and I'll, I'm not going to go to that, but Earlier in the chapter and earlier in the book, the soldiers seemed at the center of the suffering of Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. Just in case you weren't alive there. Just. The soldiers were mocking him. The soldiers, and can you imagine... You're a person taken off the street, as it were, and put in amongst these soldiers. They were rough and ready. They didn't really have any compassion, certainly not compassion on a Jew whose land they were occupying. And so this was their latest, um, if you will, pleasure in tormenting, in mocking, in having a go at. And... One of the things that they did was they plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon the head of Jesus. <coughs> now, I want you to know that if you are in any way a gardener and you do anything with roses, you don't touch them very easily because they are sharp. And as soon as you touch them with your hand, you can get a cut. And blood comes out of your finger. Well, the soldiers put this crown of thorns on his head and blood started to come down from his head. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed on the cross, but before the cross, there was blood shed when Jesus was on his own, when he was being mocked, when his beard was being plucked, when he was being tormented, when the pleasure of the soldiers was such, the blood of Jesus was being shed. More than this, they whipped him so that his back was opened and the blood began to pour from his back. Before he had got to the cross, before he made the journey to the cross, his blood was being shed. The precious blood of the lamb was being shed before he got there. I want, you to re I want to remind you of the scripture that we're talking about today. It says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So it is my contention that perhaps the soldiers were who he was talking about. After all, they were causing his pain. They were causing his torment. They were opening up his back. They were opening up his head, as it were, and blood was flowing out and giving him torment. <coughs> but I want you to know that a certain man named Pilate had authorized it. So if I said to somebody, go and, go and torment this person, who is guilty? The person doing the tormenting or the person who sent him? And so maybe when Jesus was talking to Pilate and Pilate said, I have power to crucify you. And Jesus said to him, well, you couldn't have any power unless it was given to you. Maybe Jesus thought back on the cross when he was suffering and, and blamed Pilate and, and thought, right, I can't blame Pilate. I've got to forgive him. 
So when he said, Father, forgive them, he was not only talking about the soldiers that was causing him the pain, but Pilate, who had put him in that position in the first place. Can you say praise the Lord? So he was forgiving, my contention is, people who were his enemies. They certainly weren't his friends. But more than that, Pilate had tried to free him at one point. So if we go back a little bit further, we seem to be going back from the cross now. If we go back a bit further, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the elders, if you will, of the synagogue had delivered him up to Pilate. More than that, they demanded he'd be crucified. Demanded that he be punished. Demanded that Barabbas, a murderer, would be released rather than Jesus. I'd rather have a murderer amongst men, they said, than Jesus, who had healed the sick, cleansed the lepers. Maybe Jesus thought of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and they were mocking he who said he could rebuild the temple. Let him come down now and we'll believe him. Maybe he heard that and then he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> what about Judas? Maybe the key to all of this was not the Pharisees. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't the soldiers. Maybe the heart of this was when Judas betrayed him. Because wasn't Judas the person who delivered him up for the money? Delivered Jesus so they knew exactly where he was, so they could take him at night. And maybe that's why here Jesus was in this state. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive him for what he's done. Who do you think? Who do you think Jesus was addressing with this scripture? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. At some point, Jesus stumbled. And they made Simon the Cyrenian carry his cross. Now, I, we, we don't know a lot about Simon. If I was Simon, and I was watching this spectacle, suddenly I was dragged down and I had to carry this heavy wooden cross, I wouldn't be overjoyed. I wouldn't be best pleased. I would be resentful about what was going on here. Why, why pick on me? Why don't you get one of his disciples to do it? What's this Jesus to do with me? Now, I want to indicate to you something here. The scripture, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, was directed towards the Father. Father, forgive them. In the Old Testament, there was a time when you paused to reflect on something. When we pause and consider something in the Old Testament, there was a little word used called sila. So whenever you see, see the word sila in the Old Testament, it's a pause. Hang on a minute. Think about this for a moment. So I'm going to think about, if Jesus is saying forgive them, what does forgiveness mean? So we're going to pause for a minute. Let's go with two definitions. It's always good to throw in some definitions when you're preaching. Psychologists define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance towards a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. 
that sounds about right. Because all of these people, the soldiers, Pilate, Judas, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they'd all done something, contributed to his suffering. So psychologists defining forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release, release, to release feelings of resentment. You see, Jesus came to set us free, that we might be free indeed. Can you say praise the Lord? That we can be free from chains. We sang about it. We can be free from the things that bind us. I'm going to come back to bindweed later. But that, that was the first thing. You know, you know what psychologists are like. They could be wrong. Regardless of whether they deserve your forgiveness, they could be wrong. So I'm going to go for another one. To cease to feel resentment against an offender. To give up, to give up resentment or to claim to, re, uh, to requital or forgiveness can be stated pardon, which means to an excuse an act without penalty. I'm going to do it and I'm not going to charge you anything for it. It's, it's more or less what it says. Now, in Acts 2.38 it says we need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You know, we, we, can, we can get bogged down in words sometimes because remission of sins, what does that mean? Does it mean taking it away, uh, adding it? You know, we, we, can, we can think. So when we're baptized in the name of Jesus and we sang about the name of Jesus, I want to state to you that remission could be defined as the cancellation of a debt, a charge, or penalty. Forgive means to stop, feel ang stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense, flaw, or mistake. So remission is the debt has been paid. Jesus paid my debt of sin on the cross of Calvary. That is why I am baptized in the name of Jesus. For the remission, for the cancellation of sin. For the blood of Jesus took away my sin. You see, when the soldiers finally got him to the cross, it didn't end there. It didn't end with the crown of thorns. It didn't end with the stripes on his back. They then had to nail him to the cross through his arms and his legs, the pain must have been excruciating. And he still said, Father, forgive them. I hope you're with me today. It's a cancellation of a debt. It's a cancellation of a charge or penalty to stop feeling angry. Jesus could have felt angry. Jesus could have felt resentful towards somebody or a group of people. You know, I wonder how many soldiers it took to crucify Jesus. There was probably an escort, but at least I would suggest one on one arm, one on the other arm, one on the legs, at least, to put the nails in. So there's probably three. Let, let's say there were three, just for the sake of argument for a second. Jesus could have, could have focused his anger, if you will, his resentment on those three people who were causing him the most pain. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What do you mean they know not what they do? They know what they're doing. They're crucifying you. What are you talking about? When you say they know not what you do. Well, is it because you're special? Well, Jesus was special. He came to take away the sin of the world. But he said, they, know, they don't understand what they're doing. They don't comprehend it. 
And this is the dangerous part of what I'm preaching to you today, so I hope you get it. If you have received the Spirit of Christ, you are a new creature. Can you say praise the Lord? If you have received the Holy Spirit in your life, you are a new creature. The old person is passed away. The person who was dead in trespasses in sin has to die. The new person, the new creature has to come forth and be like him. Now, I want to read another scripture from the book of Acts just for a moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Acts chapter 7 and verse 60. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, let not their, let, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, to me, that sounded like a prayer meeting. Somebody knelt down prayed, and then he fell in asleep, fallen asleep. Can you say praise the Lord? Have you been in those prayer meetings? But I want you to know that Stephen was being stoned. Stephen was being stoned by lots and lots of people, and one of the people in charge, isn't it interesting how there are people that do and there are people who are in charge of what they do? And Stephen said these words. He said, lay not this sin to their charge. I put it to you that he had the same spirit that Jesus had when he said, Father, forgive them. Now, he forgave those people. They were his enemies, I would suggest to you. But one of those people was Saul. One of those people who was in charge, held the coat, do what you like, he was the one in charge. And it was Saul who was to meet up with Jesus on the Damascus Road and become Paul. Now, if Stephen, I want, I want to ask you the question. If Stephen had said, Lord, keep, just nobble these people. Don't, don't forgive them. This is, you know, unbelievable. They're, they're stoning me. And of all I've done, if he'd have not said that, could it be? I asked the question that Saul may not have become Paul. I don't know. That, that's too deep for me. It's, it's well over my grade. It really is. So we can, apparently, if we have the Spirit of Christ, forgive our enemies. Can you say praise the Lord? Only say praise the Lord if you can. Ooh, told you it was dangerous. I haven't even started yet. Now, I want to, I want to move it on a little bit because I can imagine. I can forgive my enemies. They're idiots. I can forgive my enemies because they don't understand what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I can, I can go with that. And some people find it easy to forgive enemies. Some people don't, but hey, that's... But I want to ask you today about friends. <laughs> oh, God, help us. Forgive us, for we know not what we do. Friends... People that Jesus had eaten with, ministered to, healed, been in their homes, where were they?
maybe Jesus had to say, Father, forgive them. But they don't realize what they're doing by not speaking up. Where were they when the crowd was shouting, Barabbas, Barabbas? They were shouted down. Did they not have a voice? So Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It could have been referring to friends. You still haven't got this, so I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to ask Pastor to come up here for a minute. Hallelujah. Oh, God. I haven't actually, but there you go. Right, if you face that lot. Right. <clears throat> now, believe it or not, my pastor and I have been friends for 40 years. Uh, 1981. Um, and I would like to say that he's my best friend. You might even say he's my only friend. <laughs> but that's not true. I have other friends. Now, he would probably say, I am his friend. Amen, amen. He didn't say it. He didn't say it. I was nodding. <laughs> yes, you are my friend. Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Tell you what, this is hard. Told you it was dangerous. Now, in 40 years of being friends, in 40 years of being best friends, now look, look at me, mate. Look at me. I, I'm a preacher. They, they ordained me. The general board examined me under a microscope, said, yeah, I can ordain you. They looked at him many years ago, ordained him, yes. He's a good minister. So in 40 years, there's nothing that I have to forgive him for, and there's nothing that he has to forgive me for. Can you say praise the Lord? I don't believe you. You're not listening, are you? Hallelujah. It is true to say, over 40 years, that I have forgiven him things. Sister Wynne said, Amen, hallelujah. <laughs> She's in trouble now. And 40 years ago, I, f I had to forgive him things. 30 years ago, I had to forgive him. 20 years. Do you know, in the last year, I've had to forgive him stuff? Hallelujah. This is a man on the channel. This is the ministry I've had to forgive. But it's worse than that. Over the 40 years, he's had to forgive me of the things I've done. Can you say praise the Lord? Amen. So you said amen quickly that time. Thank you. I want you to understand that when Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, he was forgiving his enemies, but he had to forgive his friends as well. Because they weren't with him. And we have to forgive. And I, I might even share a few scriptures on that front later. And I want you to understand, and I want you to go back a little bit, to release Feelings of resentment or vengeance. You know, if I hadn't forgiven my pastor and he hadn't forgiven me, we could get really niggly with each other. We could actually tear each other down. Very simply. We're quite clever that way. <coughs> Jesus forgave his enemies. Jesus forgave his friends. But I want you to understand something even more today. He had a family. His disciples walked with him, talked with him, 
slept in the same places as he did, traveled the same boats that he did, climbed the same mountains that he did. And yet, during his ministry, and at the end of his ministry, there were those that betrayed him, there were those that denied him, and there were people who ran away. Now, we all know the story of Peter. He denied him. We know the story of Judas. He betrayed him. But the runners, John, the beloved disciple, it didn't mention him by name, but the disciples ran away. The beloved disciple, the one who he was closest to, the one on the Mount of Transfiguration, there he was with Peter. When Jesus was transfigured, he couldn't get much closer. There was an inner circle of people. If you like the family that Jesus loved, and this was the disciple that Jesus loved more maybe than the other disciples. And he ran. He ran away. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Some people worry about receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's really important that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. One of the ways that you know you've been filled is that you speak in tongues. One of the ways you know that you've been filled with the Spirit is the spirit of forgiveness that you have in your heart for others. <coughs> Somebody said to me once, can you forgive me for this? I said, that's why we're here. That's what we do as Christians. Everything else is an added extra, I would suggest. Matthew 6 and 12. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's not me, that's the word of God. It's found in Matthew chapter 6, if you wish to look at it. Peter, being clever, said, how many times should I forgive? Until seven times? Over 40 years, I think my pastor has probably annoyed me more than seven times. Trust me. Over 40 years, I've annoyed him more than 40 times. Or is that seven? I've forgotten. But I want you to know that Jesus said, not seven times. Not seven times do you need to forgive, but much more than that. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother, their trespasses, their family, if you will. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees say, well, who is this man who thinks he can forgive sin? Jesus said, so that you know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin, he said to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Jesus had the power to forgive you of your sin. You have power through the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive your enemies. You have power to forgive your friends. You have power to forgive your family. And in doing so, you establish, you welcome the Holy Spirit in your life. Can you say praise the Lord? 
<clears throat> and when you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught against any, that your Father which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. It says it again in Mark. Judge not that you be not judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Luke 11, 4. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There is an evil in my garden. It's called a root. And that root is so difficult to get out. Can you say praise the Lord? And the Bible describes a root of bitterness that unless it's removed, it will grow. And the root of bitterness is horrible because it has little tendrils. If you don't know what a tendril is, look it up. Google it. But it's small bits from the root of bitterness. So it may be just one thing that is established in your garden, but the tendrils Okay, branches if you want to be. The tendrils grow. And unless you get the rid of the root of bitterness, it will grow. I hope you're with me so far. To whom ye forgive anything, this is Paul speaking. Remember him, Saul, the one who stoned him. Stick. To him ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Complicated verse, but what he was saying was, as Jesus Christ dwells in me, I forgive you of your trespasses against me. I'm going to be closing with this but I'm going to go back to my original scripture. Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You've probably heard me say that a few times today. Do you know what's really sad? Is the last part of that scripture, which I didn't read. They parted with raiment and cast lots. Though they heard the words, they didn't care about them. And they continued what they wanted to do in their own way. And so they were not changed. But there was a centurion that looked up and said, Surely this man was the Son of God. The words of Jesus upon the cross are many. And you can look at them and you can analyze them. But I believe the most important ones are here. Father, forgive them, for they don't understand what they're doing. And they didn't even understand after he said And they continued on with what they were doing. I want to put it to you today that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. That my sins are forgiven because of Jesus Christ upon the cross. He forgave his enemies. He forgave his friends. He forgave his family. And he forgave us. We were aliens, strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. In due time, Christ died. Jesus died for you and for me. He didn't bear any resentment against the soldiers. He didn't bear any resentment against Pilate. He didn't bear any resentment against the scribes and Pharisees. He didn't bear any resentment against Judas. He didn't bear any resentment against the people he'd healed. He didn't bear any resentment resentment towards the people 
who were his family, who deserted him, who betrayed him, who denied him, who ran from him. And because of that, his blood cleanses me from all sin. We go back to the psychologists. We are released from resentment. We are released from the chains of the roots of bitterness in our lives that would seek to tie us down and tangle us up. And we are free. Father, forgive them.